This is our attempt at some sort of tribute, as if any words could even get any close. Years ago, I talked to an army ranger who climbed the cliffs of Point du Hoc. This is a cliff that is overlooking the beaches of Normandy. And there were giant guns on top of this cliff. And they had to be taken out. First and foremost, had to be the first thing they did. Otherwise, they were just going to lob down on the Americans landing on the beaches and the whole thing would be over. They'd have no chance. So before anything else happened, before there was any landing, we needed to take out these pillboxes, these little concrete bunkers with a little hole in them, just big enough to shoot down on the beaches. So the plan was we're going to have these army rangers land early in the morning when it's still dark out and somehow climb these enormous cliffs with ropes and then engage in hand-to-hand combat. I can't see, like if someone told me the plan, I'd be like, what are you talking about? That's, no, that's impossible. That's not going to work. But they, they're like, no, that's what we're going to do. So they tried it. And like everything went wrong. There was a storm. The currents were really strong. And they landed three miles off course. Three miles. That's not close. If you're driving right now, put your uh, odometer, you know, reset it, go three miles. That's how far off they were from where they needed to be. Okay, so you got to hoof it over three miles to start off. But by the time they did that, the sun came up. So they lost the darkness. They lost the element of surprise. And because they were all wet, the ropes, they had these ropes on the ends of like these rockets that are shooting them up on top of the cliffs, like, like grappling hooks were, right? But they were wet now, so they were heavy. So many of them didn't make it up. The ropes didn't make it up. So how are we going to climb this thing now? Some of the ropes did. So we're like, okay, great, we'll climb these ropes. But we're covered in mud. We got barely, like, you know, we barely move. Oh, and there are now a bunch of Nazis on the top with machine guns shooting down on us. But don't worry, it's not that high of a cliff. It's only 110 feet, which is a 10-story building. That was the mission. That was the reality. Are you kidding me? 225 men started. 77 were killed. It's amazing any of them survived that. That's impossible. That makes no sense. But the mission was accomplished and D-Day could proceed. So I was talking to a veteran. One of the men. I talked to one of the guys who did that. It was like 10 years ago. And I asked him if he's ever been back. He said, yes, I've uh, said I've been back. He said he went back with his wife. Yeah, whatever. 30 years later, he went back. And he said he put his feet over the edge of the cliff. He walked to the edge of the cliff and he put his toes over the edge of the cliff and he looked down. And he said, there's no way we did that. There's no way we did that. And you would say the same thing. You can go now. You can go to Point to Hawk. I recommend you do. You go check it out. And you can do the exact same thing that this man did. Put your, put your toes over the edge and look over the edge. And you'll say the exact same thing. There's no way they did that. How could anyone ever do that? How did that possibly work? And there's a monument there now. There's a monument. And it's so simple. And all it says inscribed in this stone, it says, to the heroic ranger commandos who under the command of Colonel James Rudder of the 1st American Division attacked and took possession of the Point du Hoc. That's it. And at first, I saw that and I was like, that's it? 
That, what do you mean that's it? Like, how can... Like, what you, there's, you, 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 there's no story here. Like, what, what do you mean that's it? And then I, I finally realized, no, no, no. There's, there's so much beauty in that and just that. Every single World War II veteran I've ever talked to, every single one of them has said the exact same thing. I was just doing my job. That's it. We were called to do a job. I had to do my job. Okay, what was the job? Uh, saving the world from the Nazis and the Japanese imperialists, two of the most evil regimes in world history. Just doing my job, said the once 19-year-old ranger climbing the 110-foot tall cliffs of Point du Hoc. Just doing my job with machine guns coming down on me. Just doing my job. What are you talking about? But I love this memorial because it doesn't give any of the details. The most famous memorial inscription ever was placed at the Battle of Thermopylae. It was where the 300 Spartans went and fought and knew they were going to die. And there was no illusion that they were ever going to come home like they knew they were going to die. Uh, and they were fighting against the, the, the massive Persian army. And the, the whole point of this was to give enough confidence to the people of Greece that they could that they could fight against the Persians too. Like we're just going to do the best we can here and hold off for as long as we can until the Persians kill all of us and hopefully war makes it back to our to the, everyone else and they get up and fight as bravely as we have. Like that was the whole point. And the memorial says, go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here obedient to their laws we lie. That's it. That inscription, that memorial, says nothing about the battle. It says nothing about the Spartans. It doesn't mention the enemy. It doesn't mention the context. It doesn't mention the outcome. <laughs> it leaves out all the stakes of, of, you know, what was at stake in the whole thing. Left out the name of the men. Didn't mention anything about the, the command. Didn't do anything. Didn't mention anything. And... And that's the, the greatest battle inscription ever. And Stephen Pressfield said, uh, the key to that line and that memorial is obedient to their laws. Obedient to their laws. It's go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here obedient to their laws we lie. Obedient to their laws, meaning their, their code of honor, their code of honor, their valor, their integrity. The Spartan warrior was obedient to this standard, to our code of laws, to our expectations. And the, the details of the battle don't matter nearly as much as the obedience to their code of honor that they showed there on that spot. So the question, of course, is what is our code of honor today that we're called to be obedient to? Our veterans, our World War II veterans, they certainly knew the stakes. And that's why I love the simplicity of that memorial. To the heroic ranger commandos of the 1st American Division attacked and took possession of the Point du Hoc. Like, like, like so matter of fact, so simple. Like, yeah. You know. Well, what happened here? Oh, the, the Army Rangers, they attacked and took possession. <laughs> oh, okay. But it was impossible. It was impossible. I, I can't imagine these guys, because they trained for it. Like they knew the mission. It wasn't like they, they did it. You know, they came up with it the day before. They were training for it in England and preparing to climb the cliffs and everything. But the entire time they're training, they had to be like, there's no way this will work, right? Like we're all in agreement this isn't going to, I mean, we'll do it. But this, I mean, there's no way it's going to work. Maybe, I don't know. I, just, I can't, I can't fathom it. Stephen Ambrose wrote a book on D-Day. He said, but for all that American industrial brawn and organizational ability could do, for all that the British and Canadians and other allies could contribute, for all the plans and preparations, for all the brilliance of the deception scheme, which is one of my favorite stories of D-Day as well, is that Hitler thought that it was going to come from this other area in France. And, and the Americans did all this deception campaign to, to make Hitler think that that was a kid. It's like brilliant. Uh, for, the, for the brilliance of the deception scheme, 
for all the inspired leadership. In the end, success or failure in Operation Overlord came down to a relatively small number of junior officers, non-coms and privates or seamen in the American, British, and Canadian armies, navies, air force, and coast guards. If the paratroopers and glider-borne troops cowered behind hedgerows or hid out in barns rather than actively seek out the enemy, if the coxswains did not drive their landing craft ashore, but instead, out of fear of enemy fire, dropped the ramps in too deep of water, if the men at the beaches dug in behind the seawall, if the junior officers failed to lead their men up and over the seawall to move inland in the face of enemy fire, why then the most thoroughly planned offensive in military history an offensive supported by incredible amounts of naval firepower, bombs, and rockets would fail. Add to that the fact that none of this was done to conquer any territory. It wasn't done to preserve any territory of ours, but it was just done so that Hitler would not destroy freedom in the world to make it even more incredible. Ambrose says it just shows what free men will do rather than be slaves. At least that's who we used to be. I hope we still have a bit of that today or enough of us still have some of that today.